If we look at the time of day, we can see here, uh, here's midnight, here's the early morning hours, and the numbers really jump up here in the late afternoon and early evening. That's prime time for severe weather. The reason for that, heat energy from the sun plays a key role in developing thunderstorms, and typically the warmest time of day is gonna be mid to late afternoon, so that's the time of day thunderstorms become most active. So think about this when making your tornado preparedness plans, if you work a second shift, uh, if you have children that are home alone from, uh, after school for a couple hours in the afternoon before you get home from work, they need to know what to do. Uh, so you need to have a plan for that time of day when severe weather is most likely. This is a map showing tornadoes around the country. You can see uh, tornado alleys right through here, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, more tornadoes here than any place else in the world. Uh, Dorothy and Total live about right there. Uh, but you can see there's kind of a secondary maximum across parts of Illinois and Indiana. In fact, Illinois ranks fifth in the nation in tornado frequency per square mile. We average about 43 tornadoes per year in Illinois. Looking closer in at the Chicago uh, metro area, uh, this uh, is a graphic uh, in, uh, depicting tornadoes over about a 120 year period across the Chicago area. A couple things that stand out here. First of all, most tornadoes move in this direction. Uh, from southwest to northeast. That's typical motion of thunderstorms in the spring when we get a lot of our tornadoes. Now, as we transition into summer, it's not unusual for storms to move towards the east or even southeast. We just don't get as many tornadoes that time of year. But in late August 1990, we had a tornado that uh, moved southeastward through the town of Plainfield and uh, produced an F5 tornado. The other thing I want to point out here is that we've uh, had tornadoes in all parts of the Chicago metro area. Um, you know, some people think that Will County is some kind of a tornado alley here, but uh, you know, if you look at a long enough period of time, you can see that tornadoes have occurred over all uh, parts of the Chicago area. The other thing I want to point out here is some people think that the city of Chicago is somehow immune from tornadoes because of the cool water of Lake Michigan or because of the tall buildings. And both of those are false. Uh, you can see we have had tornadoes within the city limits. We have had tornadoes that have gone all the way out to the lakefront and beyond. And other tornado, uh, tornadoes have hit other cities in recent years. We've had tornadoes right through the heart of Fort Worth, Texas, Miami, Nashville, and other cities. And if you've been following the news this spring, we had tornadoes in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, St. Louis, um, Birmingham, Alabama. So they can hit cities. Now we've got a rating scale for the damage caused by tornadoes. It goes from zero to five, and it's called the EF scale. F stands for Vegeta, a professor uh, from the University of Chicago that developed this uh, rating system back in the 1970s. And the E means enhanced. Uh, a few years ago, a group of scientists and engineers got together and uh, made some adjustments to the wind scale. Most of our tornadoes in Illinois, fortunately, are the small, weak variety, uh, EF0 to EF1. They generally have winds of around 60 to 100 miles per hour, do very minor damage. Very few people are killed or injured by the small, weak tornadoes. Um, the next category, the strong tornado, would be uh, EF2, EF3. Those are capable of doing more significant damage. They're longer lasting and, and a lot more destructive. If you recall, uh, last summer we had tornadoes that hit uh, down in Streeter and Dwight and into Kankakee County. Those were F2 to F3 tornadoes to give you a, kind of a frame of reference there. Finally, the extremely uh, large violent tornadoes like, like we saw in Alabama and uh, in uh, Joplin, Missouri. Those are extremely rare. About one or two out of every hundred tornadoes gets to be that size and that intensity. Uh, but they can occur even here in the Chicago metro area. In fact, if we go back uh, over the last 50 years or so, we see that we have a, a pretty extensive history of large violent tornadoes in the area. The most recent, uh, the F5 tornado that hit Plainfield, that's the only F5 ever documented in the Chicago metro area. But we had F, an F4 tornado in Lamont in 1976. Uh, probably our most uh, notorious outbreak was April of uh, 1967. We had 10 tornadoes that day, three of them were rated F4. Uh, one hit up in Belvedere, one hit Lake Zurich, and the other one hit Oak Lawn, and that one continued east through Evergreen Park in the south side of Chicago. So that's a little bit of information about some of the threats in the area. Next, you need to be able to receive warnings about those threats. So let me talk a little bit about that. Some of the products that we put out at the National Weather Service, uh, watch and warning, hopefully you've been, you're familiar with those terms, they've been around for a long time. The watch is actually issued by a special office known as the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. They issue all the watches for the country. 
and a watch may cover a fairly large area, maybe parts of a couple of states, and is usually in effect for about six hours. That's just kind of your heads up that there's a potential for dangerous storms moving into the area over the next few hours, so just be prepared and keep an eye on things. The warning is issued by the local National Weather Service office. We're located in Romeoville, and from there we serve the entire Chicago metro area. And warnings are issued pretty much storm by storm, and so a typical warning would last maybe 30 to 60 minutes and would affect a fairly small area, maybe parts of a couple of counties. This is our office in Romeoville, and the big uh, thing that looks like a giant soccer ball is the Doppler radar. And the Doppler radar is a great tool for showing us where the storms are, and we can see certain uh, features within that storm that might indicate that there's rotation or that there's large hail or, or damaging winds in that storm. The other part of the display is the Doppler part, which also gives us wind information, so we not only see where the storm is, but we can see how the wind is blowing the raindrops around inside the storm, and sometimes we can see a circulation that might lead to a tornado. Now, the one thing I want to stress is the Doppler radar can never actually see a tornado on the ground because a Doppler radar can't look down to ground level. The radar is looking aloft inside the thunderstorm, and sometimes inside the core of the thunderstorm, we'll see that parent circulation sometimes well before the tornado actually reaches the ground. So using Doppler radar technology, we can do a better job of getting advanced warning out for dangerous storms. This is our web page. A good way to stay informed is just keeping up with what's going on with the weather. Uh, on the previous page, I, I, I didn't mention the uh, outlook. Before the watch and warning goes out, the National Weather Service puts out a product every day called the Hazardous Weather Outlook. It's just kind of a forecast of any dangerous weather that might be headed your way. Uh, and we'll try to specify in that outlook, if we're going to have thunderstorms, uh, what's the main threat from those thunderstorms? Is it going to be hail? Is it going to be wind? Is it going to be tornadoes? Is it going to be flooding? And we'll try to pin down what time of day we expect the storms to move in and what area is most likely going to get hit. And you can find that uh, hazardous weather outlook on our web page here. This is what our web page might look like. Uh, there's a color-coded map here which shows you uh, if there's any watches or warnings in effect for your area. And then uh, over on the menu here, there's a list of uh, different things you can look at, different types of forecast, radar images, satellite pictures, current weather data, historical weather data, and so forth. But the top thing on the, on the uh, menu is hazardous weather, and right there it says outlooks. That's where you click to see the local hazardous weather outlook that we put out every day. Another good way to stay informed is uh, we're going to have uh, representatives from some of the TV stations here. The local TV stations will either interrupt the program or at least put a crawl on the bottom of the screen to notify you if there's dangerous weather in the area. You can also get uh, weather information on commercial radio. Um, they'll interrupt and give you the uh, latest watches and warnings as well. But probably the best way to stay informed about weather is this little device down here called No Weather Radio. And on the table as you came in, uh, there, I have some pamphlets there about weather radio. The National Weather Service has a network of radio stations around the country where we just broadcast weather information 24 hours a day. And the nice thing about the weather radio is that we'll uh, announce the watches and warnings on there with a tone alarm. So if you have one of these radios, even if it's turned off, just sitting quietly on your desk, when we issue a tornado warning for the area, we send out a tone that actually activates your radio and sets off a loud alarm to get your attention, and then we broadcast the warning. So even if you're sound asleep in the middle of the night, this thing should be able to wake you up and give you that information. Uh, you need to buy a special receiver to get this broadcast, and they sell these at uh, electronic stores, uh, Radio Shack and Best Buy and Walgreens. Uh, a lot of places sell them. You can find them online as well. And they only cost about $30 or $40. Now, the uh, city has a good uh, uh, warning system here in, in the city, uh, a network of sirens that they can activate for severe storms. But you need to be aware that sirens are really designated to be outdoor warning systems. If you're outside taking a walk, if you're at the beach, or if you're at some type of an outdoor activity, that's a good way to get informed about uh, dangerous weather moving in. But if you're inside an enclosed building, you're probably not going to be able to hear that siren outside. So having a weather radio actually brings that alarm right to where you are indoors. Next, uh, you need to, once you get uh, word of that uh, warning, um, you know, the Doppler radar does a great job of giving us information and helping us get warnings out, but we also rely on a network of trained weather spotters that report in. 
Uh, weather spotters are people that go out and watch the sky for us. If they see a funnel cloud forming, if they've got tree limbs blown down, if they're getting big hail bouncing off the ground, they'll pass that information on to us at the National Weather Service, and that helps our forecasters do a better job and make better decisions about warnings. In addition, it's uh, helpful for different facilities um, uh, to have spotters. I mentioned the Parsons plant had trained spotters at their facility, and they went outside and kept an eye on the sky and uh, let the, the employees know that there was dangerous weather heading that way. So spotter, uh, spotters are really an important part of the uh, severe weather program. And uh, if you're interested in becoming a trained spotter, we put on classes that are free. They take about two hours. These are typically offered before severe weather season, generally from about February through April. So we have nothing else scheduled for the summer. But check our webpage uh, around January. We'll have a complete schedule of classes posted up there uh, if you're interested in attending. Next, uh, once you get word of that warning, whether it's from a spotter or from a uh, 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 alarm or a siren, now you need to take shelter. So let me talk a little bit about sheltering. Closet or bathroom, get in the bathtub. We plead with you. Now this is a large tornado that hit the Oklahoma City area several years ago. Tremendous amount of debris in the air. We pray. And what we're seeing in this video is flying debris, the most dangerous part of the tornado. If you're east of I-35 over to take Air Force Base, please, we plead with you. Go to your safe spot now, take your radio, forget the live pictures, go get safe. Oh my gosh. I, folks, we plead with you, just go, go to your safe spot if you possibly can. That's, that's an F, look at, the, look at the horizontal vortex. That is an F4 to an F5 tornado, that's winds of... Okay, so really the, the most dangerous aspect of any tornado, especially in an urbanized area like Chicago, is going to be the flying debris. You got pieces of broken two by four and roofing material and glass and gravel hurling through the air at 150 miles per hour. That, when that makes impact with a, another building or with a person, it's going to be very destructive. So the best thing you can do if there's a tornado headed your way is get down below ground level and get out of the path of that flying debris. So in most cases, the basement's going to be the best place to go. Now within the basement, I would recommend getting under a piece of heavy furniture or under the stairs or take some blankets, uh, pillows, sofa cushions, something to cover your head in case debris does fall into the basement. This just in, a monster tornado is tearing through Dayton, Ohio. That's my mom and dad on. Looks like the pressure is headed right for the Dayton Ohio Hotel. That's a classic. Uh, hopefully that's not going to happen to you in the basement. In general, the basement is going to be a pretty good place to go. Now, Parsons Manufacturing Plant, typical industrial type building. Most of those types of buildings do not have basements. Uh, it's just built on a concrete slab. So what do you do in that situation? Well, when uh, Mr. Parsons had this building built, he insisted on having reinforced concrete bunkers built in three different spots in that building. Now, he was told it would cost him a lot more to build it that way, but he insisted, and that certainly paid off for, for him and his employees. So uh, if you don't have a, a basement, you want to try to find concrete. That's the best thing you can do is find a concrete shelter. In fact, a lot of homes in Alabama, places like Alabama and out in uh, Oklahoma, uh, the soil there is really not conducive to building basements. They have a lot of tornadoes in those areas, but they don't have many basements. So the next best thing to do in that situation, a lot of newer homes, they're building what they call a safe room. It's just maybe you take a bathroom or a laundry room or some interior space and put concrete around, around that one room, and that's your safe place to go. Now here's an apartment building. Uh, you can see the top floor is pretty much completely gone here. The second floor is pretty heavily damaged, but the first floor is in pretty good shape. So just getting down to that lowest level gives you a much better chance of surviving the tornado. One story ranch house here, the roof is gone, the outside walls are gone, but the interior walls are still standing. So unless it's the, you know, the top of the scale F4, F5 tornado, uh, small interior spaces are going to hold up pretty well. So a bathroom or a closet or hallway in the center of the building on the lowest floor is a pretty good place to go.